we'll start with this. Saul, Paul, same person. Uh, just different languages, same words, same name, same same person. Uh, what? So if that confused you, uh, there you go. That done. What um, else was confusing, misleading, weird about how we read that those scriptures? What is it? They were out of order. They were going backwards. That's exactly right. We went from this defining feature of what Paul understood Jesus to mean, this odd story about his own realization that Jesus mattered, um, to this flashback from his youth, impressionable, violent, and vindictive. How did we get there? How did we get from a man who started out as a judicial apprentice to religious extremists, holding their robe so they could bash in Stephen's head with rocks, how did we get there uh, from Paul, let's say 22 years old or so, this guy who had become a first century Joseph McCarthy, searching out people who weren't quite exactly the type of Jew that the authorities demanded. There were lots of different kinds of Jews out there, but the people in charge wanted exactly this, and he was the one who'd go out there and punish them, sometimes offering 39 lashes with a whip, which in their uh, culture, in their set of laws, that's one fewer lash than a death penalty. So it's as close as you can get to a death penalty. How did we get there from his flash of a realization that, oh, love is more important than the party line, and my party line hasn't been very loving up to this point. How did we get from there to this commitment to peace and unity and love as a description of how God cares for the world and how our hearts can care for the world? That's a question for Paul today, but it might as well be a question for any of us. I mean, how did Hanson get to be, I mean, imagine me in my 20s. You know, if I drive some of you crazy now, just picture what I was like back then. I couldn't put up with myself back then now, and I have so much patience now. No, I don't. That's what I keep working on. I keep working on patience. And how did I get on this path uh, of wanting to do better and atone for those mistakes and help others walk on a softer journey? How did you get from where you came from? Some of you, I mean, remember, you don't want to remember. You don't want to remember what happened back there 20 years ago or on Tuesday. You don't want to remember. Some of you, you can't remember those things, but now you're in church trying to get your life back together. How did that happen? Others of you, not so long ago, you had these dreams, these values. I want to make money. I want to be important. But, oh my gosh, how did you get to this place where you are respecting fulfillment and grace and service and giving back? How did you let go of that anger? How did you gain the patience? How did you gather this better vision of yourself still striving to be the man or the woman God hopes for you to be? How do we, as a people, go from there and grow to be here? And this is the hardest part. How do we keep growing? What else is out there for us? And how do we seize on to that? That is the question that Paul, his whole life, brings to us. And to take a stab at that, here's Paul's life. A case study. A man who struggles with bitterness. Anybody? A man who studies with judgment. Relationship issues. A man who uh, really has ends up with health problems that, that make him think the world in different ways, crises about what life means, and still somehow, even through all of it, people say he's not good enough, which you know, defines a lot of my uh, life. Uh, through all that, Paul changes the world and inspires people to work through their personal conflicts with grace and with hard work. And eventually he inspires people to work through their inner conflict, to trust in grace, to trust in the power that moves toward love, to trust in the mercy to lay down his grief and shame, to trust in a hope that has always been there by his side, no matter what the world threw at you. We've all got junk, and what if we could move toward that the way that Paul did? So how does Paul get there? Uh, first step, how Paul gets there, um, it's uh, Facebook. <laughs> no, it, that's my best explanation, though, my best uh, uh, analogy, my best parable. This week I did something on Facebook that can only be described as miraculous. I got into an argument with someone, <laughs> And, 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 and they backed down, and they erased their post about gun violence. I'm telling you, uh, I was gentle. Uh, she started out kind of a cuckoo. Uh, but I protested, and she listened, and she took down a post that was kind of dangerous. I think this is as miraculous as talking snakes or walking on water. Um, but it might be the first time in the history of the world that this has happened. But it would not have happened. It would not have happened had she not been open and intelligent enough. But consider your own experience. How hard is it to convince someone when they're wrong? <laughs> How hard is it to convince yourself when you're wrong? How hard is it to convince someone when they're, they're, they're being dangerous or immoral or on the wrong side of history, on the wrong side of peace? How hard is it to convince someone that love is more important than the party line and the party line isn't always about love? I mean, there are some obvious problems in our world these days. 
Uh, and so many people la, 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 will not change their mind, no matter how far we try. But Paul changed his mind. And don't oversimplify the Bible. Just imagine Paul. Don't just picture him at the end. Remember, this is a religious, violent extremist who changed his mind. He was privileged and protected from the real life that people lived. He was groomed to lead a movement that used violence to intimidate. He was groomed to lead a movement that used this really gross combination of uh, religious hypocrisy and uh, political alliances to craft <coughs> pressure. Paul was not just a blogger, conspiracy theorist inspired by invasion and lies about how hard life is for the Romans. No, Paul was the one who shaped the movement. He was in charge of breaking people's lives. He was the one urging politicians to steal parents and lash them while their kids were back in school. He was the one pointing to legislation to make those people's lives harder. He was the one doing the mental gymnastics to try to convince people about Jewish supremacy and wealth supremacy and male supremacy. I tried to rack my brain all week to figure who in this world right now is closest to Paul when Paul was young. It's, uh, it's Tommy Lauren. It's Tommy Lauren. For those of you who don't know, she's, uh, she's like free market Barbie, and when you wind her up, she spits out whatever racism or misogyny she can. Um, but it works because she's just so darn pretty that people pay attention to her. Uh, so that's Paul. Don't over sanctify him. Paul was a young, obnoxiously aggressive fanatic. Until he wasn't. Until he changed. Until he found grace. Until he found justice. Until he found a voice for equality. How is that miracle? Happened in this flash. We talked about this flash of light. And we don't know whether that's something that happened, whether it was metaphorical. I've had plenty of metaphorical flashes, flashes of insight, moments of maturity for you know, a couple seconds and they go away, moments of wisdom. Um, and they seem so often to come out of nowhere, but I know in my heart that it's taken years to get to this point. It's taken years to build up there, years of experiences that I don't notice until they coalesce into a flash. Years of little things that build up love and years of little things that tear down my excuses and my self-centeredness. We've all had these moments of aha. And all of them have been primed by the seeds of the Spirit. And for Paul, as he was being so aggressive, he must have tried so hard not to listen to his victims, not to humanize them, to not listen to them pleading for mercy. The hardest is when he would try not to listen to them forgiving him for what he would do. But somehow it soaked in. Somehow it touched him. Somehow, uh, if we let it, it can touch us and soak into our heart. He must have tried for years to hold on to what his teacher said about a God who blesses these and curses them. <clears throat> he must have tried so hard to twist Jesus' message into something dangerous and socialist and snowflake. He must have tried so hard to ignore how much the early Christians trusted in the power of life and love even in the face of death. He tried so hard to ignore it, but it soaked in as it can for us, if we let it. He had been so entrenched, so brainwashed, so committed to his brand, that nothing could get through those walls except something did, and wore down his defenses, and he changed. Maybe as we can, too. Can you imagine that miracle? Can you imagine how the early Christians would have felt? Uh, the ones in Damascus that saw him coming, would they, would, if you were an early Christian and Paul came walking down the road, would you have trusted him? No. You would not have trusted the guy who wrote half the New Testament. If you were on his side before and you saw him hobnobbing with the early Christians, would you have trusted him? No. He switched to the other side. He had no team. He was stuck. It must have been really difficult for this guy, but he trusted in God's grace and the power of his call. And he did not stop at a flash of realization to settle in to Satan acceptance, and neither do we when it matters. When re we realize she was trying to teach me, treat, treat me well. I just couldn't understand it because I wasn't ready for that lesson. Or he was trying uh, to love me in a way, I just took it as, as hurt. Or I don't have to hold on to that pain. I, there's a better way than to me to live in these habits. Therefore, I will live different. I'm going to work on leaving that baggage behind. I'm going to work on reconciliation, forgiveness, rebuilding that relationship. Any of that sound familiar? The miracles of change in our life? Many of us have been there, but imagine Paul, not just a relationship, not just a perspective, not just a religion, 
his whole foundation about a point of life was shaken. Oh, it's not about purity. It's not about precise belief and following the rules and having authority. It's about love. It's about welcome. And therefore, he could have had that realization and then just let it sit there. He could have just accepted to agree to disagree with people on both sides and walked his way. But instead, his whole direction turned. He committed himself to love and to growth. He committed to being a guide for others on that path and trying to take what he learned and learn more and teach more and spread that flash of the Spirit through the world. I start to think of what that's like in our world today. And the, and the analogy, the miraculous analogy, is imagine an alcoholic who gives in to sobriety and succeeds at sobriety and then becomes a sponsor, as many people do. And as a sponsor, then starts their own group and then rewrites the 12 steps. And then connects with billions of other addicts who have felt that desire but never understood why or how to follow it. That's Paul. Because when we get to Galatians, where it says, don't break us into Jew or Greek. Don't divide the world into rich or poor. Don't even notice the difference between male and female. Back then, um, I know this sounds crazy, back then the world was really tense over issues of gender and economy and race. <laughs> Changed so much. Uh, the world today is so often shaped by these evil divisions of genetic, oligarchic, and patriarchal powers. And in Galatians, Paul, who had, uh, who had claimed to all that privilege, he had it all. He, plus, he was, he was straight and educated, white, male, all the things. And Paul says, God's on the side of love, which means God is on the side of the vulnerable, which means God is not on the side of all the junk that society tells us is important. God is on the side of coming together, and not some baloney about tolerating intolerance. God is on the side of unity, which means God is not on the side of disunity, which means anyone who had been like him before, anyone who is like him, anyone who disdains other races, stigmatizes the poor, celebrates male power, Paul is not meeting you in the middle. Can you imagine Jesus in a situation of abuse saying, well, let's compromise on this abuse? The pervasive pain caused by genetic, oligarchic, patriarchal power that does not have a valid claim life united by Christ. And Jesus, and this is how, what Jesus meant to Paul, Christ is about building up anything that gives rise to love, and Christ is about breaking down anything that gets in the way of love. This is a good sense. We're going to put this one on Facebook, so we're going to say it again. Christ is about building up anything that gives rise to love, and Christ is about breaking down anything that gets in the way of love. Amen? Amen. All of Paul's young life had been fighting against that. All of it. It's a miracle he changed so much. It would be a, it'd be a miracle if, if, if you, whatever you're struggling with, whatever you're fighting against, you could leave that behind. It is beyond a miracle that he not only had that, but the strength to face the shame and the grief about what he had done. He had the strength and, the, and power of vulnerability to see what he had done so awful to people. What would that be like if we had that power? Christ is about building up anything that gives rise to love, and that includes your trust in the God of mercy. Christ is about breaking down anything that gets in the way of love. And that includes our own self-pity around our past. The past does not define who we are. The way Paul says it near the end of his life, uh, maybe 30 years of, of working through this second act, uh, we don't know, 50, 60, somewhere like that. He's, he's, he's moving up there, uh, and he's been writing a lot, and now he finally has, he finally has it condensed. He understands better than ever uh, how, to, how to take the seed of the Spirit and let them sprout and flower in our soul. And this is what he says in Romans 8, probably right there at the end of his life. He says, nothing will separate us from the love of God. Not death. Not my death. Not your death. Not the deaths that we've caused. Not the choices and habits that we've made. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. Nothing in this life. Not angels, as crazy as that is. Not powers, as much as they try. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. Nothing in our past. Paul talking, he's got a lot of past to deal with. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. Not anything we're doing now. Not anything we might do in the future. There is no power out there that can separate us from the love of God. Nothing higher, nothing deeper than us. Nothing in all creation 